Welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. The parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 is going to be the text that we cover today. In a lot of churches, the reading will skip over some verses, verses which I personally think are highly significant for understanding exactly what's going on in this parable. So we're going to take at least a minute or so and take a look at at those passages, which includes a quotation from Isaiah. And we're also going to draw upon some other Old Testament passages, as well as some writings, some other Jewish non-canonical writings, such as 2nd Esdras, to uh, provide a bit of a background for some of the imagery that is used in the parable. As you might know, in Matthew 13, there's a lot of parables, and this particular one heads the list. And uh, for that reason, it is significant. It kind of is the, the doorway, as it were, into the rest of, rest of the parables. So we'll get going with verse 1 of Matthew 13, and we'll hear kind of the setting, and then we'll go from there into the parable and then into its interpretation. So Matthew 1, 1 through 3. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables saying, and we'll get to what he was saying in just a minute. But as I frequently point out in these videos, context is crucial. And I think it was last week's video I pointed out that oftentimes our chapter divisions, which are not part of the original text, nor the verse divisions, part numbering part, uh, part of the original text, but very often our chapter divisions will blind us to seeing connections between what precedes the beginning of one of our modern chapters. So take a look at this screen. This is right at the end of Matthew chapter 12. So Jesus is speaking to the people and his mother and his brothers show up. They're outside and they want to talk to him. And Jesus replies, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. So that's our context here. And I think that is an important context because what we're going to hear in the parable are basically four different kinds of reactions to the word that is sown into the soil. And one of those is the right kind of response. It's those who do the will of our Father who is in heaven. So Jesus in the house uses family imagery his brothers and his sisters, those who do the will of the Father. When he moves outside, he's he's going to use outside imagery. He's going to be talking about the the soil and seed and crops and all these various images that are drawn mainly from from outside. But anyway, that context is important because in the parables, we're going to hear about how you do the will of the Father. You receive his word. You receive Christ. You receive the the word of the gospel. And then that bears fruit in, in your life. Now, He's by the sea. He's turned this, uh, he's turned this pulpit into, into a ship, and uh, he's rather turned this boat into a pulpit, and so from there he's going to teach, and he's sitting, because that is the, the, the sitting, sitting posture is the posture of a teacher in, in, first, in the first century Jewish world. So anyway, that is the, the, the end of chapter 12. Let's see exactly what Jesus began to say as he told this parable. First of all, the ESV leaves out the Greek word, a translation of the Greek word "idu," which means "behold" or "look" or, more colloquially, "check this out." So, pay attention. Check this out. Look, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, before we get to the interpretation that is going to follow this, I want to point out the verses that are skipped by a a lot of, of lectionaries, that is kind of uh, systems of reading that determines which gospels are going to be coming up for which gospel readings will be coming up for the Sunday. In in most lectionaries, there's si- a significant number of verses that are that are skipped over between Jesus telling of the parable 
and then his explanation of the parable. So this is what it looks like. The, the text, which is mainly in blue, is what is skipped over verses 10 through 17 in most lectionaries. So Jesus finishes by saying, he who has ears, let him hear. Now, if you're just sitting in, in the pew on Sunday, the next words you're going to hear are, hear then the parable of the sower. And maybe you won't realize that verses 10 through 17 are completely skipped over. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on these. Uh, we certainly could, but I do want to point out a couple of things. So the primary text that Jesus is going to quote is from Isaiah chapter 6. This is after the call narrative of Isaiah, when Isaiah says, well, what shall I preach? What am I supposed to proclaim? And then God goes on to tell him uh, some of the words that are quoted here. But what I want to direct your attention to is that Jesus talks one, two, three, four, six different times about hearing. So hearing they do not hear, or they have ears, but they do not hear. But he says to his disciples, there are many prophets and righteous men who wanted to see what you see and didn't see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And then the very next words he says in verse 18 are, hear then the parable of the sower. Another key word here is understand. So they heard, but they didn't understand. They will never understand. They won't understand with their heart, Isaiah says. Again, that's picked up by verse 18. The one who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown. Sown in his heart. And again, heart is another one of these key words that is in this section that's skipped by most lectionaries. For this people's heart has grown dull. They don't understand with their heart and turn. And then verse 18, when the evil one comes, he snatches away what has been sown in his heart heart. Now, I mainly want to stress that because it just shows how important context is. And uh, this is just my personal opinion, but it drives me nuts when (laughs) those who plan the lectionary skip over these kinds of verses, which are in many ways the interpretive entry point into understanding exactly what Jesus is communicating here. You take those verses out and you lose all of these key words, all of these key ideas that are part of the the very fabric of the parable that that Jesus is telling. But I'll get off my soapbox. You get the point. Pay attention to the context, that which precedes, and also, of course, that which is interspersed within the parable and then its interpretation. Basically, what Jesus is saying by his quotation of Isaiah is that those, the the, the context in Isaiah is, is, is idolatry. So if you have ears that don't hear and eyes that don't see, then you have become like the idols which you worship who have eyes, but they do not see, and ears, but they do not hear, and mouths, but they cannot speak, so on and so forth. In other words, the people of Israel who are engrossed in idolatry in Isaiah chapter 6, they become like the idols which they worship, and so they can't hear the word of God. Whereas those who are hearing, who are seeing, they have been given that gift by God, and as a result, they are remaining faithful to to Yahweh, to the true God. So that's the context, and Jesus, in quoting this, is basically contemporizing that which Isaiah said, saying, same situation is here. There are people who have eyes and can't see, ears and can't hear, because they are engaged in idolatry. And this, of course, characterizes many of the religious leaders. Their idolatry might be their veneration of tradition over the Word of God, or veneration of their own self-righteousness over God. Whatever their idol might be, it's blinding them to the true message that Jesus is proclaiming. So that's, that's the important context. Now, Leaving that aside, I want you also to think about the, the Isaiah, another Isaiah chapter that's kind of in the background here. And I think in many churches, this is at least one of the options for the Old Testament reading for that's joined with this gospel. And this is from Isaiah 55, well-known verses. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Now, the parallel that's drawn here is the rain and the snow coming down from heaven and creating the seed, which creates the bread for the eater. And that is then likened to the word of God. But that's kind of part of the the montage, if you will, this, 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 Im- these images that Jesus is drawing from, from from the Old Testament about his word being a seed and it's going into the soil and it's going to 
produce that which he desires, especially in that fourth group of, of listeners. Now, there's other context here too. If you go to the book called Second Esdras, which uh, is in some churches, a very minority of churches included in the Apocrypha, it's uh, dated to 1st, 2nd century A.D. ordinarily, but it's, it's fairly contemporary with, with the New Testament. There's a couple, pa- couple of passages in it it's, which are simply kind of reflecting this same kind of idea of, of sowing and seed in the Word of God. So we'll just look at a couple of these. This is 2nd Ezra 9, 26 through 37. I'm just going to look at one part of it, verse 31 and 32. This is God speaking. For I sow my law in you. So this is the idea of the the Torah being sown in them. I sow my law in you, and it shall bring forth fruit in you, and you shall be glorified through it forever. But though our ancestors received the law, they did not keep it and did not observe the statutes. Yet the fruit of the law did not perish, for it could not because it was yours. So here you have the idea of not just kind of the word of God in general, but the law being sown forth in the Israelites, and it's supposed to bring forth bring forth fruit. Of course, that's going to be paralleled somewhat in in the parable that Jesus tells. And then also here, a little bit different kind of imagery. This is also 2 Ezra chapter 8. Just as the farmer sows many seeds in the ground and plants a multitude of seedlings, and yet not all that have been sown will come up in due season, and not all that were planted will take root, so also those who have been sown in the world will not all be saved. Now the point there is that seed is likened to people. And just like all these various seeds are not all going to grow up, only some will, some won't make it. So the author here is saying also all people pictured here as seed will not be, will not be saved. Again, it's a somewhat, it's not an exact parallel, but you can see within the first century that this kind of language, this kind of, these kind of themes of the word of God being sown and the law being sown or seeds making it and some seeds not making it. All of this is kind of part of the, the cultural parlance of the day. And so when Jesus uses this, he's both drawing from the Old Testament as well as echoing some of the ways in which other writers were also speaking with regard to the law or to the Word of God and to seeds and the various ways in which those seeds grew or, or did not grow. All right, so we had the parable. We have the bit of the context. We have the Isaiah Isaiah reference that Jesus uses where he talks about ears and eyes and seeing and not seeing and, and hearing and not hearing, all of that. Now, let's jump down to verses 18 and 19 and begin to hear the interpretation that Jesus gives. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Now, if you, if you look at the screen here, I've got a comparison from the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke chapter 8. And, of course, we could go through this detail by detail, verse by verse. I just want to point out how the, the, that which is sown is described or is interpreted a little bit differently in each of these. So in Matthew, it's called the word of the kingdom. So the word of the kingdom of God, we might expand it to say. The kingdom word, that is what is being sown. In Mark 4, it is the word, just simply that. The sower sows the word. And then in Luke, he says the seed is the word of God. So different ways of explaining this. The word, the word of the kingdom, the word of God. But either way, it is the word which both Jesus is to to pick up on John's gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But it's also the word which is preached, the word that is all about the kingdom of God, its its establishment, its revelation, its growth, and it's just the word itself. So all of those are various ways in which the seed is described, the seed which is being sown in all kinds of of different places, just kind of thrown prodigally, we might say. Almost... uh, irresponsibly is not the best word to use, but you get the idea. It's just kind of this thrown here and thrown there. It's not, as it were, looking for just the exact right place to be sown. It is given freely. It's given uh, prodigally, just kind of thrown out there at all these various kinds of places. All right? Now, let's unpack a little bit of what is said here with regard to this, this first example of how the word is received or not received. So, 
it, it's sown along the path and the birds come and they, and they eat it up. Now, the birds connection with Satan or the evil one, as he is described here, is reflected also in some other Jewish literature. So there's a link between Satan and birds in Jubilees, uh, chapter 11. If you go to the Apocalypse of Abraham, there's another connection there. And then also in the Talmud, uh, you have this same kind of connection between the evil one and birds, which someone with my last name is a bit troubling the connection with the connection with the evil one but be that as it may these are kind of the the images the animal images then that are used to describe how when some people hear this word of the kingdom this word of god this word then they don't understand and then the devil comes in and under the form of these birds and he and he snatches this away so you have the image of the heart really being the the place where that word is, is is sowed and that rings true with the old testament because the heart is is the epicenter of who a person is so don't think of just kind of the that that beating organ in your chest but the heart is kind of the totality of who you are so the the seed is is sown in there but it it doesn't do any good it's not believed it's not received it doesn't grow nothing because the devil comes in the evil one comes in and snatches this up before there's anything that takes root and, and lives there. And this basically, of course, just describes those who, who hear the Word of God and nothing happens uh, whatsoever. There, there's no belief. There's, there's just simply uh, a rejection or a snatching away, as the devil does his work of keeping us in, in unbelief, because that is, of course, exactly what he wants to do with people, keep them in unbelief, keep that seed from taking, from taking root. But there is a second group, a second uh, way of not receiving or receiving temporarily this word, and that's described under the image of the rocky ground. So this is Matthew 13, 20, 21. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Now I want to point out there's nothing wrong with receiving the word with joy. That's great. Now, the problem here is not the immediately receiving it with joy. The problem is that the, 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 the endurance is not there. It's, it's short-lived, so it's an immediate joy, but there is no root, and because of that, when tribulation comes, then there's a falling away. Now, I, I, I find this interesting. So this idea of persecution, this idea of falling away, this language is reflected elsewhere, both in the Old Testament as well as in, in other parts of, parts of the New Testament. So as far as the tribulation go, that's thlipsis in, in Greek. And this is from the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. This term predominantly denotes the oppression and affliction of the people of Israel or of the righteous who represent Israel. The constant tribulation of Israel in the Old Testament has become the necessary tribulation of the church in the New Testament. The former is thus an indication of the latter. So thlipsis or tribulation, don't think of that in terms of, you know, you got a flat tire or even your house burned down or you got cancer. I mean, all of those are, are, are from minor to major pains, uh, problems, sufferings in life. But that's not what tribulation is. Tribulation is something which is specifically related to you being a follower of the one true God and being oppressed and afflicted because of that. It happened to Israel in the Old Testament, and it happens to, to the church. So that's what tribulation is talking about. So it's basically synonymous with persecution, which is also being used there. It's kind of the word itself has this idea of being pressed. You know, you're just, you know, like the walls are closing in, you're being pressed by all of the, the issues, the problems related to you being a, a follower of Christ. Now, the whole image of falling away, that is skandalizo. Of course, we get our word scandal or scandalized from that. And this is the same word that is used in Matthew 26. Of course, same gospel, just later in the gospel. This is the night Jesus is going to be betrayed and arrested. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now, I think that's important because it, I, there seems to be a tendency that we have sometimes, and, and maybe this is just my impression, 
but to think of these various categories within the parable, you know, the ones that the bird snatches it up before it, anything happens or the shallow soil or the rocky soil or whatever it might be. We tend to think of these as categories in which a person remains. Not the case. <laughs> there, there have been plenty of people who were in that first category and the, the evil birds came and snatched away the seed and now they're in the fourth category. Okay, so don't think that these are like static categories. And if you're in one or if your loved one is in one, that's it. That's where you're going to be. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. Uh, and that that example that I just quoted from Matthew 26 shows you why did the disciples scandalize? Why did they fall away? Jesus says, you're going to do this because of me. And yet what happened? Well, they all came back well, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, but they all came back. Right. So it's not as if whatever this particular soil is, that that's where, that's where you are. No, it doesn't work that way. The, this, is, this is describing various kinds of ways that the word is received or not received or temporarily received, and not just kind of people in these categories for the remainder of, remainder of their lives. All right, next interpretation is in verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So if the former was about the oppression, the thlipsis, uh, the, the persecution that, con- that can come and, and ordinarily will come to a person because they are a follower of Christ, and because of this there's a falling away, then this one is about not any kind of persecution, but it's a matter of disordered loves. It's a matter of prioritizing non-God things above God himself. So this is really a case of idolatry. Uh, It could be the deceitfulness of riches. It could be the worries of the world. It could be good things such as family or job. It could be any number of things. So it's the idea that God is relegated to second, third, fourth, fifth, last place, whatever whatever it might be. And so this is the image of, of the thorns. They, they, they choke, out that, choke out that word. By the way, when I was preparing this video, it, it, it struck me that he doesn't just say riches. <laughs> he says deceitfulness of riches. And that got me to thinking, hmm, what is it that is deceitful about riches? Maybe the deceitfulness of riches is that they seem to promise that which they cannot deliver. They seem to promise peace and and wholeness and happiness and all those sorts of things that people are looking for security that they're looking for in in wealth and yet that is a lie it's it's deceiving you because it's wooing you toward that which cannot satisfy our deepest human desires and by the way this goes all the way back this idea of deceit and deceiving goes all the way back to genesis 3 so I, I did a word search on the, the Greek verb that is used here for, that's the, the, the verbal counterpart of this noun for, for deception. And it's the verb that's used in the Septuagint in Genesis chapter 3. So in Greek, the noun is just uh, apate, but apatao is the Greek verb that's just a, the, you know, the, the verbal form of this noun. And that's what's used in Genesis 3.13. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent apatao'd me. He deceived me, and I ate. Now, that is a, that's, a, that's a perfect counterpoint to the deceitfulness of riches because, of course, the devil is promising things that he can't deliver. He's leading them toward that which they think is going to make life so much better. They can be like God, knowing good and evil. And yet, that's not what is delivered. That, that is not what they, what they thought they were going to get is not what they got. They were deceived by this deceiver. And riches are kind of like that too. We think that, oh, if I only have that much more, if I only can get this, then I'll be, I'll be happy. I'll be, I'll be complete. I'll be just who I want to be. Do not believe that lie. Riches cannot fill that hole in your heart. Only God can do that. He designed us to to be that way. There's nothing wrong with riches, but don't think that riches or anything else in this life is going to be able to to fill that God-shaped hole that we we all have. Okay, now, those are the first three. Let's get to this last group. Verse 23. 
As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. There's our word understand once more that we were lifted that we lifted from uh, those skipped over verses and from Isaiah 6 in particular. The, this is the one who hears the word, and there's hears again too, and understands it. And he indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. So what's going on here is that the Word is actually doing its work. And here's where I think that we sometimes go astray, because it's very easy for us to kind of think, uh, if we're a believer, oh, then we must have, we've got such good soil in our hearts that uh, it's because of us that this, this, this great thing is going on. It's so we're going to, you know, pat ourselves on the back. Do not make that arrogant mistake. <laughs> the, the only reason that any kind of growth is taking place is because, first of all, this has been gifted to you, and then secondly, it's happening because of the seed. The power is in the seed. The power is in the Word of God, in the giver of that Word. That's where all of this growth is, is coming from. So, lest we think that the hearts of good soil belong to people who should pat themselves on the back. Remember what Jesus said. This is just uh, earlier in the chapter. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Anytime you see a passive like that, it's a divine passive. So God has given you. It's a gift that you know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. That's why. So to understand, to receive, and to bear fruit leaves no room for boasting, but the giving of thanks. It is the giver and the sower and the seed that deserve our attention, not our, not our hearts. So th those are the, the four different ways in which there is a reaction to, to the Word of God. Sometimes it's rejected, sometimes it's choked out by thorns, sometimes it, it, there's immediate rejoicing, and then there's a, there's a falling away. Uh, sometimes it actually begins to take root and to eventually, eventually bear fruit. And all of this is basically what God is doing in our world, both, both as he calls preachers to preach and as he uses those of us to, to, to sow the seed of the word, he's doing it all over the place. And it's not up for us to go around and look for the right kind of people to believe. They don't exist. It is up for us to simply throw the word out there and let the spirit do the work so that those to whom it is given will learn the secrets of the kingdom of God, will believe will receive this, not just with joy temporarily, but with joy permanently and, and bear fruit. That is what I really love about this parable, is the idea of this the prodigal sowing of the seed all over the place. Oh, is, are there thorns over there? It doesn't matter. Throw it there. Is that shallow soil? It doesn't matter. Throw it over. Is that a pathway or a road? We'll throw it there. Because ultimately, it's up to God to give the growth that is there, that's, that's in that very seed, in the Word of God. Let me close with uh, one of my favorite hymn stanzas. This is from uh, not a well-known hymn whatsoever, uh, but the, it is, it's a good hymn. It's just not very well-known. It's by Martin Franzman, and it's called Preach You the Word. I'm just going to read you the, very, the, the fourth stanza. So this is talking about how, what, the various, uh, what happens to the seed in these various soils. Though some be snatched and some be scorched and some be choked and matted flat, the sower sows, his heart cries out, oh, what of that and what of that? In other words, he does, there is no wasted preaching of the Word of God. It's never wasted. What of that and what of that? So I throw it over here. What of that? I throw it over here. What of that? We're not worried about results. We're not worried about finding the right soil and just sowing there. God calls us to sow here, there, and everywhere. And very often it's the people that we don't think would ever believe who end up believing. And sometimes it's the people that we think will for sure believe they don't. So the soil of the heart is that which is God's prerogative, not ours. We've simply been called to preach, to teach, to share the gospel, and then to let that seed do its work, let the Spirit do His work while we ourselves give thanks to God that we have received this seed, that we believe and we pray that he will continue to be at work within us through his spirit, through that seed of the word of God, so that it may bear fruit in our lives. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. If it's been helpful to you, then uh, share it with your friends. And if you're watching this on, 
on YouTube, then please click and subscribe. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thanks.